if, if I know my history correctly, you sit on the left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's the right side. <laughs> well, here we are. Here we are. I just, I just want to begin. Everybody has permission to go home anytime they want to during this event. Including me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially you. This, this is true. Years ago, I was addressing a naturalization ceremony in the United States District Court, and I said, if you really want to hear something valuable, go across the hall. There's a panel of the 11th Circuit sitting, and the presiding judge had Syrian parents, born in Mexico, naturalized in this country, and now she's a presiding judge on the panel of the 11th Circuit. How did that happen? How indeed? I don't know. Am I not right. the luckiest person in the universe? <laughs> Has to be. Well, how did you get from Mexico to the United States? I, I did not now, swim the Rio US. Grande as an illegal alien, <laughs> first of all. And I don't want to hear US 14. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, although, I, I will say, I don't, I, I'm not even sure I could I've said this publicly before, but my parents did swim the Rio Grande before I was born uh, and came to this country illegally. They were arrested in... Uh, you don't have to go there. <laughs> Texas. And the sheriff in Texas and his wife were so kind that they, although they had to hold my father in the jail, the sheriff's wife said, I am not going to let this woman and her children sit in the jail. And so they took her into her home. And eventually, of course, we got re they got returned to Mexico. But my parents, my mother was so grateful for the kindness and sweetness of the law enforcement people in Texas that every um, year, she would make this huge meal for the prisoners in the town in which we lived in Mexico. Why am I telling you all this? But I, I mean, know. it was very impressive. And, and I remember helping with that and serving the prisoners in the, in the jail because she remembered that experience. But anyway, that was before we came. Otherwise, we came because my parents had tried to come from Syria to the United States. The quota system uh, precluded them because my mother had been pregnant when they had permission to come. And then when they were able to come, uh, there were if those of you may not know, there are quota systems from each country that so many can come from to the United States. And so they thought that somehow or another they could come to the United States if they came through Mexico. So somehow in the 1920s, it's really amazing what people went through. I, I, I'm, I'm in awe. Whatever it is we've gone through, it, it, what your parents and your parents' parents have gone through to get to this country is quite remarkable. Anyway. They made it to Mexico, they got on a boat in Mar Marseille, made it to Mexico, and then they were caught in the same quota system, so they lived there for 20 years, which is where my, parent, my sisters and brothers and I were born, and then eventually we were able to come legitimately after the Second World War. Justice Perianti touched, <laughs> touched upon what you're doing now. You gave up a lifetime appointment for the United States Court of Appeals. Why did you leave a lifetime appointment to do what you're doing now? And what are you doing? <laughs> Besides sitting here with Hank Cox. <laughs> um, it was very hard to leave the court. I love the court system. I've been uh, lucky enough to be participate in every level of court. But when you reach a certain point where you've been able to take senior status for two or three years, um, you think you're not going to, but then somebody called and offered me the opportunity to participate in a whole different kind of court, um, in a whole different kind context. At first, I was extremely reluctant. And then Harold Coe called and said, it's the only entity in which, at, at that time, now there's a little bit more of a, of a detente, but at the time said, it's the only entity in which Iran and the United States function together within the context of a rule of law. And I thought that would be a fascinating opportunity to learn a lot of new things. And um, you don't often, at, at this stage of my life, get an opportunity to do something interesting 
and learn a lot about a whole nother system that I never knew existed. And so I took advantage of the opportunity. Right, now there is a person special to many people in this room whom you were very close with. Tell us about your relationship with Ray Ehrlich. Oh, I loved Ray Ehrlich. I loved Ray Ehrlich. He was, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about him. He was, um, he was so smart, and he was so thoughtful, and he was so caring, and he was so, um, he was able to bring people together, and he was so calm about everything he did, and at the same time, he had this wicked sense of humor, as many of you have to know about Ray Ehrlich's, I can hear somebody that knows Ray Ehrlich's sense of humor. He would write me notes on the bench. Uh, your mother would be very disappointed at how you're treating that litigant. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he, was, he was wonderful. He was very collegial and he was, um, he, he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. I do miss him. You don't want to tell the story about the disbarred lawyer? The, <laughs> uh, I had told Hank the story of um, how uh, we, of course, were responsible for whether or not somebody should be disbarred. And we had voted to disbar this lawyer. And I was writing the opinion. I did write the opinion. And at that time, sometimes we did not sign the opinions. They were procurium opinions. And this time, uh, but I used to sign mine. So a Barquette, Jay, and I wrote the opinion disbarring this lawyer, who actually was from West Palm, Barbara remembers. and. Um, after we sent out the order, I was at some seminar or something, and Ray Ehrlich calls me and he says, Judge Marquette, yes, sir. You got us sued. I said, I got you sued? Yes. And he begins to read the complaint that had been filed by this disbarred lawyer against every member of the Supreme Court. And he reads the caption, which says, so and so and so and so, versus Ben Overton. Parker Lee McDonald, Leander Shaw, and he names everybody, and then he says, and that bitch Barquette. <laughs> uh, uh, well, sh shifting gears a little bit. <laughs> It's my understanding from people who know you well, a little differently, that you've got this thing about Chris Christopherson. <laughs> well, I don't know why you're laughing. What is it? <laughs> Rick knows. I'm a very. Well, we don't know, so. <laughs> I'm a very large Chris Christopherson fan, as some of you, many of you know, and. Um, that's just such a long story. Yeah, well, <laughs> we don't well, want to tell right. it. But I bumped into his son. Uh, my secretary spent a lot of effort trying to get me for my big 70th birthday party a signed uh, uh, picture of Chris Christopherson. So she had it framed for me to Rosemary. Uh, <laughs> happy birthday, Chris Christopherson. So I went to uh, Pepperdine, where I was on a panel. and. Um, some kid comes up to me and says, introduces himself. He said, hi, Judge Marquette. I said, how are you? He said, well, my name, and I didn't catch his name. And he said, I understand you're a fan of my father's. And I said, your father, I'm sorry, who, who are you? Who are you? He said, Johnny Christopherson. I said, oh, my nephew put you up to this, because I have a nephew, Stephen, Ronnie, you know Stephen, he does, the, I have some wonderful cousins here. I don't normally invite my relatives to these things, because they're sick and tired of coming to these things, but God bless these guys, they showed up anyway. But, so I said, somebody put you up to this. He said, no, no, really, I'm John, Johnny Christopherson, he's my father, my mother arranged to have that picture sent to you. I said, you have your mother send me an email confirming that you are in statement. <laughs> Lo and behold, I get an email 
from Mrs. Christofferson, who said, I'm so happy you've met our son Johnny. I, I graduated from Pepperdine, and um, I'm so sorry. We were supposed to have Chris call you and sing happy birthday to you, <laughs> but we couldn't get him to do it. If you tell him to walk on one side of the street, he walks on the other side. So there's nothing we could do. And so I wrote back and I said, well, I appreciated the picture very much. I loved his poetry. And she said, I loved his poetry too. And here we are now with five children later. And I said, well, I didn't get that treatment, but <laughs> at any rate. All right. Back. You should listen to his songs. They're kind of dated, but they're wonderful. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, <laughs> on the Florida Supreme Court, for lack of a better way to describe it, you were brutalized in a merit retention campaign by some entities. If you could change things, would you change the current merit retention process we have in Florida? Yes. What would you do? Assuming you can't go lifetime appointment. I was going to say, I, I would do a lifetime appointment. Well, we'd all do that. Um, I don't know. If you couldn't do a lifetime appointment, maybe a significant period of time, like 16, 18 years, and no ballot. I mean, it's foolish to ask people to vote on judges. The whole concept of judging is contraindicative of asking people to vote for you. I mean, um, and as you as as you've seen, I mean, it it it, it becomes a it become it becomes a farce. It becomes a question of money. It becomes um, Penny White in Tennessee was challenged a month before her election, uh, her the merit retention, and was thrown out of office because huge monies were thrown into the race against her, and she had a month to put together a campaign. When judges are not political. Most of us who have been appointed to the appellate courts have never run a campaign ever, and you're you're at a, at, you know at, at a total loss. If it hadn't been for a lot of people in this room, Martha, and Sandy, and Barbara, uh, I, I mean, I would have been at a loss. Um, I didn't want to. I didn't. You don't want to run around and ask for money. It's ridiculous, but you have to. Um, the process just doesn't make make sense. And I, you know, I, I would go to places like the Tiger Bay Club that I went to here, and I would say things like, um, you know, I don't really know what to say to you. All I can say is, if you're wrong, I'll vote against you. But that's hardly like conducive to having you vote for me on the merit retention. But what are you going to do? It's 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 not a perfect system. It's better than elections. I will say that. The idea of two people, but it's not. It is better than elections in one sense, but in another sense, it's not better than elections because people have this ridiculous false view in their head that if they unretain somebody, they will get appointed somebody who is perfect and is going to agree with them on every level. And that's not, that's not going to happen. So in a way, it's hard because you're running against a phantom thing, person, issue. I've talked to you about this several times over the years. Years back when you were kind enough to come to Jacksonville to speak to the bar, I had told you that my eight-year-old daughter had seen in the newspaper you were coming. Would I get an autograph from you on the way back to the airport? And you took out a legal pad and wrote four pages to her as to why the profession needed more women in positions of lawyers, judges, and leadership. Have things changed since you wrote that letter? Are they better? 